There's no shortage of anger in America right now. For many people, the roots of it run deep, stretching back lifetimes and beyond. Occasionally, and visibly of late, anger can explode into rage. So what's going on, biologically and emotionally, in your mind and body when you're angry? Anger is a normal human emotion, psychologists say. It's not inherently good or bad. Responding aggressively to one's own anger is instinctive and baked into our biology. Suppressing anger is known to accomplish nothing and be bad for your health. So perhaps now more than ever, it can be helpful to understand where anger comes from, how it affects us, and how anger, when properly channeled, can be a great force for positive change. Inside the angry brain anger can be fueled by distant or immediate threats. It often stems from a sense of injustice, psychologists say, whether on a personal or group level. Anger and fear both generate a basic stress response, collectively called fight or flight. Anger makes us want to fight, and fear makes us want to flee. The system is evolutionarily set up to keep us alive, to face the threat of an invading tribe or to run from a tiger. But it can be activated by all kinds of things, says neuroscientist Alicia Wolf, PhD, a senior lecturer in cognitive science at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Our response to a threat, whether it's physically in front of us or rooted in thoughts and emotions, goes like this, what we see and hear and feel goes directly into the brain's limbic system, starting with the amygdala, a primitive structure that processes emotions, among other functions. If the amygdala perceives a threat, it sends a distress signal to the hypothalamus, which serves as a command center for the body's nervous system. The hypothalamus signals the adrenal glands, which sit atop the kidneys, to release adrenaline, cortisol, and other hormones. The heart beats faster. The breathing rate increases. Airways in the lungs expand, flooding the brain and muscles with extra oxygen and glucose. The pupils dilate, sharpening vision. We're prepped for action. All this happens in a nanosecond, and the reaction is autonomic, it proceeds without our conscious involvement, like breathing. We focus attention, and everything gets amplified, louder, or scarier, Wolf tells Elemental. Meanwhile, in the frontal lobe, the same inputs are being processed in a more intellectual manner. If the threat goes away, or if the tiger is behind a cage in a zoo, the higher thinking centers will send an inhibitory signal to the limbic system, putting the brakes on the stress response. If not, Wolf says, we're potentially just one step away from rage mode. When we move from anger to rage, our focus becomes more and more narrow, and we're less and less able to take in the context of a situation. More than mere emotions bursts of anger or rage are often seen as raw emotion without reason. And while anger is, in fact, an emotion, brain scans reveal reasoning is involved, too. Reason and emotion are very much intertwined, says Anthony Jack, PhD, an associate professor of philosophy at Case Western Reserve University. Humans have two very different types of reasoning, Jack explains. Analytic reasoning relies on concrete perceptions of logic, math, and science. Empathic reasoning involves emotions and empathy, listening to and understanding the perspective of others. Each mindset tends to suppress the other. When we get angry, really angry, we become highly analytical. We lose the ability to consider other people's views or the greater context of a situation. We become highly focused on threats. Psychologist Daniel Goleman, in a 1995 book, called it amygdala hijacking. Jack calls it an inflamed amygdala, there's so much threat going on that everything's now a threat, he says. Everything is seen through the lens of threat. It's very hard in that context to focus on the better side of other people's behavior, which is what helps you to calm your own emotions. If the anger is directed at another person or group, a person whose blood is boiling will tend to look for every behavior that proves the other person is wrong or bad, behaviors perceived as inhuman, effectively dehumanizing them and setting an ethical or moral stage for aggressive action that will give the other person or group to reason to do the same dehumanizing. And so goes the vicious cycle of dehumanizing that is common in our increasingly disconnected society, Jack says. Ratcheting up to rage rage is basically just anger ratcheted up and triggered and often happens when our ability to reason with empathy is blinded by the flood of hormones. People have different propensities to feel anger or rage. Some are born with a tendency toward hot-headedness, research suggests. 
One person might be likely to respond to stress with anger, Wolf says, while another is more likely to respond with fear or by retreating from the stress. Anger can also be learned or fueled at home and out in the world. Stress on a given day can pile atop long-standing injustices. Lack of sleep doesn't help, in part because sleep and anger both are regulated by the amygdala. Heat and dehydration can shorten fuses, too. Even hunger can exacerbate negative emotions. The propensity for blind rage is in all of us, too, says Karistan Conan, Ph.D., a professor of psychiatric epidemiology at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Conan recalls the time a man was screaming at her four-year-old at the park. My husband literally had to hold me back, Conan explains in a phone interview. It may take more to push some of us, but we all have that capacity. There's no clinical definition for rage. But anyone who has felt it knows it. When we move from anger to rage, our focus becomes more and more narrow, and we're less and less able to take in the context of a situation, Conan says. Rage interferes with our ability to have empathy. Anger felt on the behalf of a group that you belong to can be incredibly motivating for activists. Group anger in recent protests, we're seeing shared anger over the killing of George Floyd, police brutality, and systemic, enduring racism affecting black people. Group anger, as it's called, is often based on race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion, and it can be emotionally beneficial to the individual and constructive for society, explains Lauren Duncan, Ph.D., professor of psychology at Smith College who studies why people get involved in collective actions, including protests. You understand that your group is being treated unfairly, either deprived of power and resources or being discriminated against or being unfairly detained or basically being treated violently when other groups are not, and that sort of treatment is unjust, is unfair, Duncan explains. Anger felt on the behalf of a group that you belong to can be incredibly motivating for activists. The same motivations and mindset of individual anger are at work in a group, but group anger is more productive, Duncan says. People who are involved in rallies or protests often do this because it's a way to feel better, it's a way to channel that anger and turn it into something sustaining, supportive. In recent protests around the country, protesters have proven by their mostly peaceful actions that anger does not equal rage. Yet long-standing anger can sow the seeds of rage, Duncan explains, as the cold intellectual-based sense of injustice turns to what psychologists call a hot, more emotional reaction, 